Hello, everybody. Um, that was a lot to all additional. I come to you from West River, Kyle, South Dakota, I'm the archivist of Oglala Lakota College, and I'm honored to be on the board of South Dakota Humanities Council. Um, I'd like to welcome you all out there in TV land. This is one of our handful of um, live streamed events. So welcome everybody out there too. Um, and welcome to the South Dakota um, Festival of Books. This is an amazing event and we have so many folks to thank and acknowledge. We have so many volunteers that make this possible as we go back and forth every other year between East River and West River. We're really honored to have um, all the participants, all the authors, all, all the volunteers, the amazing staff, Anne in the back, chair, she, she's in here with us today. Um, and our land acknowledgement time. We'd like to acknowledge first and foremost that we are on the lands of the Ocheti Shakomi, and that is comprising of the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota peoples. We honor and appreciate the indigenous people who have the longest relationship to this place. And we'd like to ask that you remember to think about um, supporting the festival. We have an amazing incentive this year, the uh, beautiful artwork by Jennifer White, um, who's down at Northern Plains Indian Art Show uh, in Sioux Falls this weekend. Um, you donate $50 to commemorate our 50 years of the Humanities Council, you'll be entered into a drawing for that painting, that painting that is on the cover of of the program. So um, again, acknowledgement, um, praise, and gratitude to all those who help make this possible. And I am remiss, I'm absent of the bios that are extensive and humbling. The work of Devin Mahasua and Gordon Henry is missing from our program, so I'm going to defer to them to um, introduce themselves. Thank you, Tala. Well, Halito Chimachukma, Sahu Chifa'ut, Devin Mahisua. And um, I want to say yoko ke to the um, South Dakota Humanities Council for inviting us. Um, and this is Gordon Henry. He'll introduce himself in a minute. And we often don't get an opportunity to present our work, those of us who don't uh, publish with big publishing houses. So this is a really nice opportunity. Um, to get attention. So we, we really appreciate y'all being here and whoever is um, watching us. So we're going to talk today about authenticity in Native literature. And certainly after listening to the Oak Lake writers uh, last night, after hearing that and we walked out, we said, now that is authenticity. And so we were greatly, greatly impressed by that and also um, Craig and what, what he did this morning and, and Diane. Um, so I, I'm a, the Coralie Beers Price Professor at the University of Kansas. I'm in the Hall Center right now. Um, I'm an enrolled member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and a Chickasaw descendant. And um, enough of that. I've, so I've written, well, 19 books, I guess. And so the one that just came out, uh, last week or week before last, um, Dance Over the Return is, I think, the sixth or seventh novel. And it's the third in the series that features Detective Monique Bluehawk, who is a, a Choctaw detective. And <clears throat> the book before that was Hatak Witches that came out last year. And then Document of Expectations before that, which is a murder mystery on an anthropology department um, based on some real people uh, that I know. and. Um, so I wanted to also announce that my books, um, these books have been now op optioned for a television series. Uh, so the Monique uh, Blue Hawk series. So yeah, I'm really excited about that. But I, I really wasn't sure where to start. Um, we were talking about how do we start, what are, what are we going to do? So after listening to Nick uh, Estes last night, he, he made a statement that helped kind of guide me. Um, I think it was to the tune of, well, I'm walking backwards toward the future. And I thought, well, now, okay, that makes sense. So, so what I'm going to do is just read um, the very brief uh, prologue to um, Dance of the Returned. And this is from the um, viewpoint of Fuji. And at this point, we don't know who Fuji is and what he's doing and why, why is this happening. 
but it's Hatak um, Hokuna, which is the dreamer. Fuji lay still, his head on soft pillows. His breathing was almost imperceptible, unusual for a large man. In his first memory, he stood in darkness. Warm breezes stirred his hair and caressed his skin. In the second, he looked up to see a shimmer of daylight. A feminine voice urged him to climb towards the circle of blue. He struggled upward, leg, lungs aching. Sharp rocks and brambles scraped and lacerated his legs until he emerged into a brilliant world. A dormant part of his brain registered that he was looking at grass, flowers, and trees for the first time. Fuji rolled onto his back and sighed. Other memories came quickly, just as they did every night. He and the others stood in the upper world, scared and shaking. Animals beckoned them to follow to search for food and water. Fuji dreamed of wide, clear skies, full moons, and thundering hooves. Still asleep, he shivered under his green blanket. Then he felt the burning summer sun. The grass beneath his feet shriveled. The dirt cracked. He began to sweat and threw off his blanket. He felt exhausted from wandering dark underground tunnels and from crossing wide plains of buffalo grass. He flinched from the pain of frostbite, of childbirth, of sprains, of broken bones, and the despair of losing loved ones. He was born countless times and died of infections, injuries, diseases, and old age. He was born repeatedly, and the memories of innumerable ancestors flashed through his mind, all complex and too indistinct to recall. Through the flash of time that was the history of his people, Fuji experienced his tribe's struggle for survival, identity, and peace. As usual, when he awoke the next morning, his pillow was wet with tears. So in this, again, we're not sure where this is headed, um, but <clears throat> when people ask me what is this book about, I never know what to say because it's hard to describe. Um, so some people who read the book, because when we publish with university presses, it goes through peer review, um, it was described as being speculative fiction, alternative history, sci-fi, uh, mystery, crime. <laughs> um, so it's kind of a lot of things, and I'm not really sure where it goes. I think it fits everywhere. But time is not necessarily, it's necessarily um, linear. Might it be circular, cyclical? Um, the past affects the present. And what happened in the past makes us who we are today. And so I advocate for finding traditional solutions to modern day problems. You know, so that's, that's how I like to look at that. Um, so what brought me to, to write this and what all is contained in this, this odd, odd book is that I write about a lot of different things. And um, I am reading from notes um, simply because I can't speak off the top of my head. And I wouldn't subject you to that, because I don't know where we'd end up if I just started talking. <laughs> That's why I need a guide. That's why I keep looking down. Um, but yeah, I've, in the books that I've written, um, I have written about um, genocide, stereotypes, um, food issues, um, violence against women, missing and murdered women, the American Indian movement, repatriation of skeletal remains and sacred objects. Um, inter and intra-tribal factionalism. Um, I've written about my family. I've written about my husband's family. Um, in Choctaw Crime and Punishment, I wrote about uh, the murder of one of my ancestors at the hands of a political rival. This was in 1884. And then on the heels of that, a book about Ned Christie, who was a Cherokee who was accused of killing a U.S. Deputy Marshal. And this occurred all around the same time. And the Cherokee Nation and the Choctaw Nation are very close to each other. And so a lot of the political issues that happened in those nations are very, very similar. And I guess my point is, of all of this writing, um, it's very stressful. You know, anybody who's a historian, you study history and you write about the history of your people, of tribes, you don't compartmentalize that. You know, if you teach about it, you don't leave it there. You know, it comes home with you because you live it, your family lives it, your tribe lives it. And again, it's, it can wear on you. And so we need stress relief, I think, which is why when I read and watch movies, it's going to be something completely different from what I've been doing in the classroom. <laughs> you know, um, it's probably why I also write horror sometimes. <laughs> um, 
But I think fiction, fiction is a way to come up with happy endings, to create an ending that I want to see. Because when we write nonfiction, we always, you know, we, we don't always have that happy ending, which is often crushing and um, leaves us with a lot of tears, I think. So I like to create role models. I like to create um, powerful women. I think that as writers, we have a real responsibility to, to create the right imagery, particularly with the missing, murdered indigenous women, boys and men, uh, peoples. I think we do need to create powerful women characters because otherwise people are gonna get the wrong idea and I don't think we need to give them any fuel um, than they already have. So I, I believe in honesty in writing and, you know, Elizabeth Cook Lynn, you know, she has always said that. You know, I've, gosh, known Elizabeth since I was in graduate school, you know, 30-something years ago. And I think we all quote her and we think about her. You know, thinking about her now, I wish she was here. And as I was telling Gordon before we started, um, she sent me recently her book called That Guy Wolf Dancing, which I had not seen. I'd heard of it, but I had not read that. And... Several of us had just gotten through reading a book that has really gained a lot of traction that is not necessarily what we'd call authentic. <laughs> and then reading this book by Elizabeth, it's like, oh, thank you. You know, it's just, it is honest and it really needs to be, um, well, it needs to be out there more so that people can see what native literature really is. Um, so um, I'm very proud of her and what she has accomplished her, you know, in her very long life. So, um, I also believe in problem solving and proactive characters. So, when an accurate accuracy when we write about places and events in the past, and I think that you have to have lived in those places, you have to know those people, you know, you have to have people in your life and in your circle. Um, who are part of the culture that you're writing about. And I think this is what really concerns us now as to what, is, what we're seeing um, that is being published nowadays. So um, having said that, I'm going to pass it over to Gordon, who I know has a lot of profound things to say. Yeah. Uh -oh. So. <laughs> uh. Give me what you would go, go me as young as you is good. Give me what you would go, go me as young as you be mad as young. Get to canoe indigenous cars, Anishinaabe and Dow, Makodorum and Dow. And I'm from the White Earth Reservation. My family's from the small village of Pine Point. And um, I'll talk a little bit about that. But first, I want to thank the South Dakota Humanities Council and the South Dakota Book Festival for inviting us back. I was here in 2019 and I wasn't sure they were going to invite me back again. Um, and then I heard this was live streamed and I thought maybe we were going to the river. I wasn't sure. <laughs> so uh, I am honored to be here. Particularly I want to say miigwech to the uh, Oak Lake, my relatives, the Oak Lake writers um, and friends. It's a privilege and honor to be uh, here with you in Lakota country. And uh, I thank you for your inspiration. As I said, I'm enrolled at White Earth. Um, I also have these uh, high-sounding academic titles that I'll share with you if you don't mind. I'm the Leslie Endowed Chair in American Indian Literature and currently the Gordon Russell Visiting Professor at Dartmouth College. I figured out they only give that uh, Gordon Russell uh, Visiting Professorship to guys named Gordon. So um, I had a good shot at that one. But both Devin and I are here. Uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a little bit about what our concerns are and then I'm going to sh share some fiction that sort of plays with this notion of authenticity, hopefully in a humorous way that you'll understand. So in the spring 1993 issue of Wichaza Saw Review, Lakota scholar Elizabeth Cook Lynn summarized key concerns of American Indian and Alaska Native professors as voiced at their annual meeting in Phoenix, Arizona. Among those concerns was eth ethnic fraud. As Cook Lynn recounted, Quote, Dr. Beatrice Medicine facilitated a discussion, sorry, I'm having trouble reading, 
a discussion of ethnic fraud, which has to do with identity issues, the current abuse, and the self-identification method used at American universities, and the claims by non-Indians to have had Cherokee, a Cherokee grandmother in order to receive educational and hiring benefits. Cook, Lennon, and the professors of that association went on to outline key points of what they thought universities should do. Now we're talking 1993. Here we are, what is it, 30 years later. Mm -hmm. um, and still um, the situation seems to be the same, if not proliferating in some ways on these issues. And it's really tough for us to speak about because um, a lot of this can be a slippery slope when we have these kinds of discussions and really determining what authenticity is and who might be authentic. So I'll start by sharing uh, I was a piece, an auto, a so-called autobiographical piece um, that I, I had no clue how to write. And I talked to a fellow native writer about it when I was asked to be included in this anthology called Here First. And uh, I had never written autobiography, didn't know what to write. And um, I, I, I ended up coming up with this, trying to figure out a structure and I hope you all can bear with the language here. It's called Entries into the Autobiographical Eye. And it has a couple of little epigraphs at the beginning. One is from a Sufi writer named Rumi. It says, I'll live in the nowhere that you came from, even though you have an address here. And uh, so I start by saying, first door, I is not I. I am not postmodern or modern. A sign or signifier between signified surreal or existentialist, neo-traditional or beat, transcendental or metaphysical, decolonized, pre-colonized, free-colonized, confessional shaman warrior or sun priest. I'm not trickster, nationalist, exile or anthropocentric psychodramatizer. I'm not dishwasher safe or microwavable, <laughs> Sunday supplement collector plate sellout. I'm not a shade or shadow chaser, powwow investor, or an angel looking backward, or an arboreal rodent roadkill. <laughs> not a coyote totem taster, clan speaker, bandstander, or dream song sonnet carrier. I'm not some villanelle revivalist or windigo washer, fumigated, fumigator, suicide doctor, freeze dried mystic, or lone ranger lover, heaven seeker, hell raiser, church leveler, drunken wanderer, sneaking, creeping, powwow, powwow playboy. I'm not two-thirds higher honor song singer, hotel lecturer, casino medicine keeper, shell shooting crow or weasel, otter or turtle, better or worst, water spirit, stargazing, anthropological shape shifter. I'm not some checkout line half-breed hero, formula detective, divided between ordinary and non-ordinary, or authentic, not natural, unnatural, deconstructive, white-hating, eros or ethos or pathos, Apollonian, Dionysian, radical, card-carrying, blood quantum physicist. I'm not an apple, golden, delicious, or rotten, or otherwise. Not a tomahawk hair splitter, not a polemicist, or a two-stepper, ten steps from a twelve-stepper. I'm not a thunder being or light being or writer of wrongs or prepackaged bead working pipe carrier or pipe fitter, iron worker, artificer of law and politics, of extraterrestrial intelligence. I'm not some medicine wheeler spokesman or jet blackjack dealer or chaos theorist, social contractor under federal control. I'm not a plains clothes wardrobe keeper, sign wearer, graffiti artist. I'm not some epidermal epistemologist with no one home, with an idea, an ego, or a paper skin, or a well-read skin, or a next of skin. Not some intellectual, personal mythologizer, disguised as a historian, or Jessica Wabano, crystal gazer. Not a biological timekeeper, or one or only, one or only to be forgotten, or a presence in an absence. I'm not a psychic autobiographer, autobiographer. No, I'm none of these. These are just some of my relatives. Some of them are buried between memories of turning leaves. Some live as we speak. Some of them are on the road. Some have traveled many roads. Some of them good. Some of them red. Some of them not red. 
Many of them red, not good. Many of them good, not red. Many of them both or neither. Still, they are my relations and I'm thankful for them. So as you can see, I try to play with sort of different kind of images and associations that have appeared in literature over time about American Indians, including, I mean, even the things that you, I used to see in sup, Sunday supplements of newspapers, these, I don't know if you've ever seen them, these Indian collector plates with the, the images on them, so I refer to that in there. So I try to make this sort of long list, and this is my trick for writing. Um, uh, when, I, when I get stuck, I just start making lists. <laughs> it, seems, it seems to work mm -hmm. pretty well, for, at, at times anyway. But I wanted to go on, you know, just to talk a little bit about, um, before maybe De Devin and I, or if we take some questions and have a conversation about some of our concerns, uh, just to talk a little bit about what I heard from the Oak Lake writers that sort of makes, you know, makes me feel like there is something, I don't know, I want to put too much pressure on you all, but there is something real out there and there's something authentic and sp spoken from the land and from place. And at that, re at that session on the republication of the stretch of the river, um, the session reminded me of realistic tenets of authenticity we might think about in the ways Amer American Indian and indigenous people relate to their work through art, writing, and story. Each panelist spoke on how the river was important to who they are they spoke of the importance of language. They spoke of re living relations with place. They spoke of their relatives. And they spoke of home where generations of their relatives were and are still rooted. Perhaps the Oak Lake writers stand strong as the most we can say about how native literature might convey authenticity, at least in my view. As deeply relational to place, their work stands as deeply relational to place generations of people, to family, to community, to knowledge stored and storied from relation to place to a history of place, as a literature that lives in relation to stories about a living world in the experience of living people. Ethic, ethnic impersonators could never speak to or imagine the depths of such a relations. And so um, as a way of going back to my more playful persona here for a minute. I want to read uh, another piece. I'm, I apologize to the Oak Lake writers um, who might have heard this too many times, but um, it's a piece that I do want to share if I can ever find it again. I thought I had it marked out. This is always difficult. Look at I've got these little note things in here <laughs> and um, never am able to find the right one. I'm sure you all remember that poem. Even before I start to read it, I'm sure you remember. Oh, there, I just passed it up. Or did I? Oh, yeah, here it is. Sorry. This might take a few minutes, but um, it's called Simple Four Part Instructions for Making Indian Lit. Uh, Beijing for the money. Take something Indian, take something non Indian, make the Indian indigenous or native or skin. Make the non-Indian, non-Indigenous, or non-Native, or non-Skin, or white. Two for the junior. Make the Indian, non-Indian, and the non-Indian, Indian, or the white Indian. Three. Make a character out of paper. Write a name with fire or sky, or a combination of color and the names of birds. Or the absence of an article with a present tense verb from a limited number of infinitives you may include prepositions, except these prepositions, forego, between, beyond, under, over, into, across, beneath, beside. Avoid all abstractions, slang, economic terms, hip phrases, or contemporary situations and signs. You may not use the following names, for example. I'm back to my list, by the way. <laughs> Forgoes hawk, <laughs> under crow, into deer, values dog. Love Crane, dances similar, in the middle of the night, red thunder banging, you can't use a cross wolf, eating horse, bling eagle, has in trust, many shoes, sun dude, chick lit, you can't use donut shop, yard sale man, beneath the ground, upside the head, do not cross, or out of position, or big credit, can't use bear pimp, 
stone suitcase, ice cream turtle, calls the taxi, waits for bus, bums the smoke, speaks the Bible, running mascara, Saint Muskrat, graffiti clouds, air flute, don't use telescope woman, medicine cheese, karma bull, Mrs. Layups, nice one, don't use red exit, off limits, or even just working. So maybe take a break. Offer a few prayers to the polytheistic Indo-European spirits of syntax. Inscribe a smoke or ceremony. Add laughter to fighting tears to anything sounding like history. Reinscribe Indian, non-Indian, white. Repeat, repeat, smoke, smudge, rinse, repeat. Make language of crossing tongues as simple as powwows for profit and dying Chevys as complex as Aristotle remains ethical and remains remain cataloged. Use newspapers, magazines, museum brochures, scatog and flint and match. Roll characters, names, words onto paper, paper into rolls. Rub with bear grease and lard or last night's ground beef. This will not work with olive oil or sunflower oil. Say four Hail Marys, a couple of ahos, or a kawikin, a hausa. Ignite all of the above. Four, after all this becomes lit, be careful about who you read to. They may be hearing Indian and everything non-Indian, as what remains from fire is not spirit. I'll stop there. Maybe <laughs> we can have some uh, questions. I, again, I do want to... Thank you. Well, I was going to read something from that new, new book, but uh, yeah, I started writing some love poems. I'm not sure you're all ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> where do you where do you come up with your lists? Are you in the shower when you think of these, or? Oh, uh, that's a great question. Sometimes <laughs> I'm in the shower. I mean, not as much as I should be, but um, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, you're running. Yeah, you know, yeah, I mean, it's like sometimes driving, but sometimes I just kind of. I just get stuck, you know, and, and don't know what to write. And I kept thinking about, like, I, 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 these, these things that are called catalog poems, these long catalogs that are included into ep works of epic poetry. Um, um, the, uh, the Iliad on the Odyssey are famous for these. Uh, Odyssey in particular has the ship catalog. Um, and so there's this tradition in literature of making these long catalogs. And um, it's one of the things that uh, I, I, like, I like doing. I mean, it's... Uh, but they also, you know, sort of accumulate over time too. But that's a great question. I got to tell you though, I forgot to, to to just honor you and the work that you've done over the years. And really, um, it's an honor to be with you. You're su you're such a prolific scholar and researcher, and have done so many good things in Native communities. I was that was part of my introduction that I forgot. So I apologize <laughs> for that. Yeah. Well, that's very sweet. I've known Gordon quite a while, and. Um, I think among our first conversations were about this topic yep. a long time ago, and we're still talking about them, you know? It, I, and I, I was also there at the American Indian Alaskan Professors Association Conference when um, they were talking about the identity issues. That was 30 years ago. <laughs> um, and, and that hasn't changed either, and you know, it, if anything, I think that it has escalated, you yeah. know? And I'm not sure what has happened as to why it has, <laughs> because I thought we had it sort of taken care of. You know, you make these statements and you think, well, that's what we need to do. We made statements. And then it's just, maybe people took that as a challenge. I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Well, it, uh, and I think at the same time, there's been a bit of a pushback in Canada in particular on some of the cases in Canada, there's the case of, uh, is it Kerry Barasa, I think it was uh, the head of indigenous health in Canada, um, claimed to be numerous tribes. They found out she wasn't, she had like a $480,000 a year position as the head of health. Um, and it gradually, people brought that out, her, her background and her history. Um, but it's a difficult conversation for people to have. Um, and it's difficult in communities, but, but also, I, wouldn't you say in the university, it's, it's been so hard to just um, get people to consider like the tribal perspective on what might be the best ways of handling these issues. And invariably, my, my experience has been we run into administrators who just don't, um, 
seem to be concerned with it, and they also don't know what to do because they, I, I think in some way they're, they're operating from an ignorance, a, a point of view of ignorance in some way on the issue. And I don't know how strongly people feel. Um, you know, we're not dispassionate people. We're not, we're people with compassion in our hearts and, and minds too, but at the same time, you know, a, a lot of the people have caused harm directly to some of our relatives, and so we have to, we have to think about the best ways of talking about and handling this conversation. Well, on the heels of that, you know, something um, that Craig said this morning, um, it was towards the end of, of your presentation about this fantastic initiative, you know, that you've got, and you said some monetarily, sometimes it doesn't work. You, you held up two books. You said maybe this wasn't the, the best idea. But I think we also have to ask ourselves, who are we doing this for? And, you know, I think it's one thing if you have a wonderful publicist and a publisher and, you know, seven-figure advance, you know, that's great and wonderful, but who are you writing for? Uh, who do you want to read your work? And who do you want to see you dance and hear your stories and um, see your show, I, I guess? Um, and sometimes it's not for the Native audience. And I always think about what are Natives going to say when they read this? Because, I mean, those are the people who, you know, those are the people who are going to give me the feedback. You know, that <laughs> that's going to scare me. Um, but those are the important people. Yeah. So there's two ways of looking at this. You know, you find a formula and then you write for that audience. But then you stick with the honesty, perhaps, and then you get the audience that you want. So I still feel fulfilled, even though I can't travel to Paris and travel around Europe and all that <laughs> stuff like some of these people do. No, seriously, I don't care. Um, I mean, it's, it's been fine. And um, so it's been good, although I've, I've been puzzled, I think, at, at some of this. Yeah, you know? it, it's, it's a hard landscape to, to know how publishers are operating on, on these issues, how, how universities, uh, it's just very, very difficult to understand on a lot of levels because, um, you know, we see someone like Elizabeth Cookland whose work isn't valued as much as other writers and mm -hmm. even, even here people in this room are writing. Mm -hmm. But I, I think part of it too is, you know, I never went into writing to be famous or make money uh, or anything like that. I did it as kind of a, an outlet, a way of sort of, uh, you know, just dealing with things that uh, I observed and didn't know how to deal with otherwise. And so that's part of why I, I do what I do. And I, I sort of still do that. I'm always of the mind that nobody's really going to read my work, that, but, you know, I get it published and uh, I feel very fortunate and blessed in that regard. But uh, we, 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 are st we still are concerned about the landscape of American Indian literature at some levels, at the higher levels, um, where there are a lot of people who are fraudulently claiming uh, Native identity, um, working and uh, speaking for Native people. And at the university it happens as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I come from a, a family where, you know, we don't speak for anyone else. You know, I mean, we, 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 we came from a community. I, I can't speak for anyone else in that regard. And so I, uh, I try to listen, I try to be part of a community of writers, and uh, hopefully, you know, in, in a good way too, any success I have, I hope I can pass it on to others. And so that's kind of where I'm coming from. But any, any other yeah. thoughts on yeah. that? Should we open it up, do you think? Or? Yeah, she's yeah. got a question. Yeah, I have a comment. You know, that issue recently came up in Minneapolis, and it was on the front page of the Star Tribune, maybe like two weeks ago, of a visual artist that mm -hmm. claimed to have ancestry and they found out he didn't and there was all kinds of discussion making it more complex than it was mm -hmm. about well the application process didn't specifically say the artist should be native and, you know it went on the side yes you know topic instead of coming to the point of we're sovereign nations mm -hmm. and our nations have the right to determine who its citizens are and that gets overlooked over and over <coughs> again. And then in the Ocheti shot going, and this complicates matters, uh, we have a ceremony. It, it's part of one of the seven sacred ceremonies of Hunka that we make relatives. 
and persons abuse that family's decision to have a ceremony and say that somebody is part of their family. Well, that's a societal custom that does not make you a citizen. And so I think people have to be honest about their relationship with the tribal community, where they married into it and then their children are native, or whether it was a hunka ceremony by this particular family. But at the top of it is we're still sovereign nations and determine who our citizens are. Absolutely. And we have that freedom and that right and that has to be respected. And nobody else in society can say, no, this person should be considered Indian because of whatever his backstory is. It comes down to, does that tribe, you know, how it enrolls or determines a citizen, have they said this person, you know, can be or is a citizen of that nation? And I think that's the thing that gets disrespected, yep. is our tribal governments have a way of saying who its citizens are. And if you don't meet that criteria, you don't meet that criteria. Mm -hmm. And so a university or anybody else can, can talk about you know, some other things. <laughs> you don't have the right to determine what another nation decides who its citizens are. Yep. And you wouldn't think of doing that to another country. You wouldn't mm -hmm. think of saying, well, no, I think you should let that person be a citizen because of he married his wife or his husband or, you know, whatever it is, you know, a non-citizen, you should make them a citizen. You know, we're sovereign. Yeah. And, that, and that never gets stated in the topic. We are sovereign and we have certain freedoms and rights that nobody gave to us. We just have them. And I think that gets overlooked in the conversation. Absolutely. Thank you for that. It's really important, and that's part of the what the administrators and publishers don't understand, and they, they don't. And, and I don't know what the answer is to them vetting those kind of questions. I mean, another example was there was a woman who claimed to be from White Earth, an artist. She was making quilts. She said her one of her ancestors was Wabanaquat, um, a treaty signer, so she made these quilts with treaty language on them and wrapped them around herself and then she sold them for $35,000. And so um, you're saying to yourself, where does this come from? Where does this kind of practice come from with this person doing this? And these are the kinds of things we're most concerned about. Uh, and I tell you, it hasn't been an easy road for, for Devin or, or, or me, but in, in part of that means for me, is this something I just have to let go of and say, forget about it and it is what it is. And there's, I think that's another part of it, but on the other hand, it's just becoming so, uh, it's, it's happening so much now, it's, it's hard, to, hard to overlook. Yes? I have a question. Um, what do you, how do you feel about non-Native writers including history of Natives in their stories? And do you think that should be sort of evaluated by Native writers, or if it's a historical type mm. fiction? Yeah. Well, are, so are you talking about fiction, like a, like a novel? Well, yeah, I mean, if, you're, if it's historically accurate in that novel, I think the problem comes about when people write about things incorrectly, or they include information that is not for public consumption, or it's a writer who says they are a member of tribe X, Y, or Z, or descended from, and then they write from that perspective, try to, or they insert themselves in the narrative as if they were part of it. That becomes a problem. A lot of times, books like that, they go through the peer review process at university presses, and, and they'll get called out, or they'll say, hey, they need to change it, or something like that. But if you have an agent, and oftentimes the way that works is the agent likes the book and then it goes to the big publishing house. It doesn't go through that peer review. They're looking at what's going to sell. And so that's when they grab it. And that's what we're seeing a lot of. I think people ask about uh, like the Hillerman novels and um, some other series, you know, that are authored by, by white writers. Um, 
those don't go through peer review. And they become very popular, I think, because maybe people who don't know the topic very well, they love it because it fits their expectations of what they think natives are. Um, it's got the stereotypes, you know, and they buy it and they like it, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, there's a lot of these. You can go on Amazon. They're all over the place. Um, but I think, you know, as long as the person isn't writing and saying, I am of this group and they're not incorporating sensitive information, um, I think it just really depends on what, what they are putting in the book. Because anybody can include history in there if it's accurate, or it should be accurate, <laughs> you know. And it might depend on how big of a splash something makes too. I mean, mm -hmm. if it gets to mm -hmm. native audiences, as you know, like some television series, or there's a book by this person named Nas Dish some years ago, and they were getting ready to make it into a film, and they had, they, but the, the irony is, is they hired a native screenwriter to sort of write, it, and it's turned out this this person had totally fabricated identity. And, um, and so the native writer was like caught because he knew this was a bunch of BS basically. And, and uh, he then, he was attacked by the studios for not wanting to do what the studios wanted them to do with that book. So, I mean, there's always, there's always a, a, a chance that if you write something with that kind of content, that somebody will look at it and, and maybe if it's making a big enough splash, people will uh, give some pushback. But a lot of times things, fly under the radar uh, a mm -hmm. lot of literature, so it mm -hmm. may not matter that much, honestly. But you know the irony, um, like the show Res Dogs, you know, that is that really is funny. I mean, it, that takes place in Okmulgee, which is right down the road from Muskogee, where my father was from and was raised, and we were just there a week ago. And But yet it still catches flack from Native people because yeah. it didn't include enough. You know, it didn't have enough of this or it didn't have that, and they start nitpicking. So even when you have authenticity in there, you're still, you're still <laughs> under the gun, under the microscope, you know, so. That reminds me too, I mean, I really appreciate that you were mentioning Liz Cook's fiction, because, uh, I mean, most, uh, most people I've ever talked to, they're interested in her nonfiction and her, her, her ideas, and, but, I, I've tried to, well, back when I was teaching, I tried to teach Aurelia, and uh, I've written uh, things about, uh, articles and things about um, her books. Uh, but um, the other option, the other thing is when it's authentic enough like that, it seems that lots of people don't understand it. <laughs> and uh, yeah. including, uh, I was, uh, I would go to conferences and young uh, indigenous uh, scholars would sort of scoff at, you know, I, I told them, well, I've read this book three times and I've noticed it. And they said, oh, I'm sorry. Like, you know, it was great hardship for you to read Aurelia, hmm. which is a wonderful book. And um, it, 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 I, I think that's another aspect is like the non-authentic things are so very popular, but the very authentic things are not. Sometimes. Yeah. I think that's true. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Either of you have a closing thought? We're, uh, we're a little bit after time, but this has really been amazing, and thank you both so much. Well, Yaku K, again, for the invitation, and thank you all for being here. We appreciate it. I didn't get a book launch, so I'm considering this my book launch. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. <laughs>